Hello everyone, Jason DeMars here from Present Truth Ministries and we are continuing our subject of Serpent Seed on PTM Contender Live. This is part six and I've been talking about this over and over again that I was going to go through uh, over 20 different points that, uh, that show us, that point us to um, why the doctrine of Serpent Seed is, is correct. So um, I'm going to uh, kind of continue on along those lines and um, we're going to go through I think I had 25 24 points um, I'm sure there's more and there may be more that come to mind um, after this and then and then once um, once I'm done with that I want to talk a little bit about the history that this isn't just some doctrine that was invented or revealed now to um, uh, in this generation to Brother Branham, but that it's actually a historical doctrine. We can go back and we can see that it was believed by the early church, that it was believed by Jewish people, that it was believed by, um, obviously, the Apostle Paul and different ones there as well. So, um, first scripture we're going to go to, well, let's before we do that, let's offer a word of prayer, dedicate this time to the Lord. Father, we just come to you and we ask that your Holy Spirit would guide us and teach us, Lord, that you would reveal your truth to us and make it clear in our hearts, Father. We give ourselves to you for your glory in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, so point number one is from Genesis 3.15. And, of course, we'll draw multiple points from the different verses, and there's not any exact order to why we're doing this um, this way. Oh, uh, one thing I wanted to mention before I got started, we, 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 um, I, I just wrote uh, a, a tract on the Godhead. It's going to come up funny on, on Facebook, but for those who are watching on YouTube, you'll see it correctly. But um, the truth of God's oneness, if you go into my um, feed on my, uh, on my page, personal page on Facebook, you'll be able to see this and, and get some if you want to, but um, it's, it's a tract for outreach. Um, it, it's showing why, uh, why the Trinity is false. It goes through some of the history and why the Trinity is false. And then it goes through Scripture on the oneness of God and uh, how, how that God is a spirit, why the Holy Spirit is not another person separate and distinct from God, the oneness of uh, the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. Um, and then it a addresses some common objections. Some of the objections are, you know, why does God say, let us make man in our own image? Uh, that means there's two persons in the Godhead, right? <laughs> um, it, another objection is, if Jesus Christ is God and the same person is God, then how can we praise to God? Um, doesn't John... One one illustrate that Jesus is the Word from eternity, and because it says with, there's two second person in the Godhead alongside the Father. So there are some of the things that addresses and goes through, and sh and shows and demonstrates that uh, that th these different points scripturally. So if you want to get a copy, just go ahead. You can. Um, it's it's a tract, so you want to order multiple at at a time. You could see what the tract looks like, and and the content of it. If, if you like it and feel, feel like something you want to use it, you can order 50 of them at a time. So, And um, just appreciate you, everyone that's watching, and pray for me. So back to our subject, Genesis 3, 15. So this is point number one. Uh, I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. I'll just leave it at that. So... Uh, First point is, the serpent is said to have a seed. Who was that seed? We have to answer this question. Who was the seed of the serpent? Who was the offspring of the serpent? Next one. Uh, and I'm just leaving at that. Uh, these, are, these are questions. We know you, you can infer the answer from the way I'm asking, but these are 25, 24 different points of why serpent seed is the truth. Genesis 3.7 and the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Instead of covering their mouth uh, from eating an apple, 
they covered their nakedness. So why cover your nakedness, uh, your, your reproductive organs, why would you cover that um, if you ate a fruit? So they covered the part of the body that they obviously sinned with. Proverbs 30, verse 20. That was the second point we just covered. Number three, eating. So, Pro Proverbs 30, verse 20. Such is the way of an adulterous woman. She eateth and wipeth her mouth and saith, I have done no wrong. So, again, eating is, is the word that is used here to refer the, to the act of adultery. Uh, Song of Solomon, chapter 4, uses the same terminology between husband and wife. Awake, O north wind. And come thou south, blow upon my garden, that the spices there, thereof may flow out. M let my beloved come into his garden and eat his pleasant fruits. So again, the relationship between husband and wife, or the relationship of adultery, is spoken of as eating. That's point number three. Number four, Song of Solomon 4 verse 12, A garden enclosed is my sister, my spouse. So the woman is spoken of as a garden. This is point number four. Number five, uh, Genesis 4, verse 8. This is attached to the scripture that God said in uh, uh, Genesis chapter 3 that there would be enmity between the woman's seed and the serpent's seed. And in Genesis 4, 8, we find that Cain kills Abel. So there's enmity between the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman. That's point number five. Point number six, Genesis 3, verse 20. And Adam called his wife's name Eve because she was, she was the mother of all living. So Eve is the mother of all living, but it never says that Adam is the father of all living. All right, why is that? Genesis 5, 1 through 3. We find here... This is the book of the generations of Adam in the day that God created man. In the likeness of God made he him. Male and female created he them and blessed them and called their name Adam in the day when they were created. And Adam lived 130 years and begat a son in his own likeness after his image and called his name Seth. So both Seth and Abel are spoken of as being in the image and likeness of Adam. But Cain is never spoken of as being in the image and likeness of Adam. Uh, th that Adam and Cain are never connected that way. Genesis 5, 3. Um, that, was, that was point number 7. Uh, uh, point, number, point number 8 is why is Cain never mentioned in Adam's genealogy? You read chapter 5, uh, verse... Uh, one through through the end, and Cain is never mentioned. Cain's genealogy is put separately, uh, and God doesn't hesitate to mention wicked people in the genealogy. He even get, go, goes to great detail to go through uh, uh, Esau's genealogy. Many many details in that, and 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 he connects him to uh, um, Isaac. So God isn't ashamed to connect those people to, to him, uh, to, to a righteous seed. But here Cain is never connected to being the seed of Adam. So that's point number eight. Point number nine, Genesis 3, 16. Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. So why does part of the curse have to do with conception and labor if the sin was eating food? If they, if they ate a, a fruit, God's going to say, I'm going to multiply your conception and labor. 
Could it be that the, cry, that the pain in childbearing indicates a, pun, a punishment that was connected to the crime? First John, that's point number nine. First John 3.12 says, Not as Cain, who was of that wicked one, and slew his brother. So that states that Cain was of the wicked one. Now if we look in the genealogy that's listed in Luke chapter 3, in all the original it says, of, it doesn't say the son of Heli, the son of Methet, the son of Levi. All it says is of Le- Heli, of Methet, of Levi. So Cain also was of that wicked one. So we can say Cain was the son of the wicked one. So that's point number 10. Cain was of the wicked one. 11 is from 2 Corinthians chapter 11. The Apostle Paul clearly believed that that the original sin was an adultery and believed in the serpent seed, as we see here in these verses. Now, he says, I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. So here he's painting the picture. This, this is, we're talking about virginity. We're talking about Christ being engaged to his bride. We're talking about her being presented as a virgin to Christ. But I, he says, but I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtility, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. So Paul's fear and concern is that the church whom he engaged to Christ as a virgin will commit adultery against the Lord Jesus Christ. And so he likens that to the sin of Eve. Eve was engaged to Adam as a chaste virgin, but she was defiled and beguiled by the serpent, and that's what produced Cain. So if Paul didn't believe that the original sin was adultery, why would he write this like this? The sin of the church is likened to the sin of Eve. His fear for the sin of the church is she will commit adultery against Christ, just like Eve committed adultery against Adam. So that is point number 11. Paul says Eve committed adultery with the serpent. Point number 12. Genesis chapter 13, and we will turn, or excuse me, Matthew chapter 13. So we're looking at point number 12. Oh my, I just love the scripture, don't you? Oh my. All right, so Genesis 13. I was on 12. Uh, Yeah. Verse 38, The field is the world, the good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. The the enemy that sowed them is the devil, the harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers are the angels. So Jesus in this parable tells us that there are two seed lines. One is the children of the kingdom, one is the children of the devil, two, two seed lines. So here Jesus portrays what is, what is going on in the book of Genesis. There's two seed lines in Genesis, and he's telling a parable, this is what it's going to be like, this is the separation. So point number 12, Jesus says there's children of the kingdom and children of the devil. Uh, John, uh, point number 13 is from John 8. We have belabored this point before and covered it again and again in our past videos, but uh, it bears repeating again along with what we're talking about as a review. So Jesus is speaking to the Pharisees and he tells them, you do, he's rebuking them. He says, you're seeking to kill me. Abraham didn't do this. He says, you do the deeds of your father. Then said they unto him, we be not born of fornication. We have one Father, even God. So here they're saying we have two options. If you're born of fornication, you're of, the, you're of your father, the devil. If, if you're from God, you're not born of fornication. So here they're connecting the, their, their lineage 
to being born from fornication. So they're going back to the beginning and saying, we are not serpent seed. We are not born of the fornication that took place between Eve and the serpent. We have one father, even God. We come from Adam's lineage. Okay, so that, that, that's point number 13. The Pharisees were of their father, the devil, and their response is, we're not born of fornication. That's the original sin, fornication, which includes adultery and, and other sins as well, homosexuality, etc. Uh, illicit sex outside of the plan of God. So point number 14, Genesis chapter 3, we have the serpent speaking to Eve. She wasn't surprised. She wasn't shocked. She wasn't repulsed by the ser serpent speaking to her. She was used to it. Not only did the serpent speak to her, but he reasoned with her. So this was a normal occurrence for her. So point number 14 is this serpent. That very name serpent doesn't mean he was a snake. It means that he was wise and cunning and deceptive. It says more subtle, more, more intelligent than all the other animals in the animal kingdom. Point number 15, Genesis 3.14 says, the God says to the serpent, Upon thy belly shalt thou go. So it follows that he was not at the time before that, before that curse, uh, he was not on his belly. So you look at that and you see that a snake is on its belly, but even further, every animal is walking on uh, four, all fours. And in that sense, they're on their belly. They're walking on all fours. Even, even monkeys, uh, orangutans and so forth, when they want to walk and go, go forward, they're, they're, they're inch forward. They're not standing upright walking like a human. But the serpent was upright on two feet walking. All right, so that was point number 15. Point number 16, uh, Cain and Abel were twins. They were born at the same time, uh, but they were from different fa fathers. And a woman can conceive from two different men, men on the same day. This is called heteropaternal superfecundation. There's even some court rulings recently regarding the situation about child support that that the one father didn't have to support both the children, but only his child. And the other father had to support the other child because they did DNA tests and saw two fathers, one mother. So that's point number 16. Point number 17, uh, Genesis 3.16, the woman's conceptions were multiplied. If she had not already conceived, how can they then be multiplied? You've ha you would have had to experience it previously in order for it to be multiplied. So uh, Eve had already conceived by the serpent and Adam, and God says, I'm going to greatly multiply your conception. So if there's nothing there, a multiple of zero is zero. <laughs> but if she's already, uh, already conceived, to multiply that is to increase what's already taken place. So point number 18 now. Uh, what was Adam's uh, punishment? Adam, God says, I curse the ground for your sake. So in uh, Deuteronomy 24, we find a situation where God is speaking about marriage. And he, he says that a, a husband who's been divorced cannot take back his original wife. He says, if you start to do this, you take back your first wife you've, who you've already divorced, remarried. Now, and now you take back that original wife, uh, re remarried, divorced, and then remarry the first wife. It says you're causing the land to sin. So wh why is it causing the land to sin? Well, you go back. Man is to have dominion over everything. When Adam sinned, everything that was under him became cursed. Immortality was taken away and, and the earth was cursed to bring forth thorns and thistles. Work was to be more difficult. And so Adam's punishment is 
already contained there just in the law. If you take back your original wife after she's been defiled by another man, you cause the land to sin. So that's point number 18. Point number 19 in Genesis 3.15 says the seed of the woman will have enmity with the seed of the serpent. Jesus is the ultimate fulfillment of this scripture. Who did Jesus have trouble with? Snakes? Uh, of the reptile uh, kind? No. He had troubles with Pharisees. He had troubles with Sadducees. Who was, who was it that he called children of the devil? It was Pharisees. And so who is the seed of the serpent in this in this in 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 Jesus fulfillment of that scripture Pharisees who is the seed of the woman Jesus so this point number 19 point number 20 now Genesis chapter 6 verse 9 says that Noah was perfect in his generations why does it even say such a thing why does it matter if Noah was perfect in his generations so Noah was from the pure seed line of Adam. But before that, we saw that there was a mixture, a hybridization between the sons of God, which come from Adam's line, and the daughters of men, which come from Cain's line. This was, there was a hybridization between those two lines, a mixture between those two lines, producing the giants. And as a result, God says, I am going to shut this thing down. And he says, but Noah is perfect in his generations, and he found grace in the eyes of the Lord. So Noah now is going to continue on the seed line. But we understand that even Noah and his wife produced uh, Ham, who was a sinner, and all the world comes from Noah and his wife, and, and, and from his children, and Ham, Shem, and Japheth, and their wives. It says the whole earth was overspread from Ham, the genetics of Ham, Shem, and Japheth, and of course their wives. And so the serpent seed line now is hybridized completely into the human race. All of us have that together within us, all right? So uh, genetically speaking, we all have those two, two lines, the seed of Adam and the seed of the serpent are all together from, from Noah. But Noah was perfect in his generations. Noah was not a hybrid. So that was point number 20. Noah, perfect in his generations. Uh, Genesis 2, verse 9. Let's turn there. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life also in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It says nothing about growing out of the ground. Those two, the tree of life and the tree of knowledge. They didn't grow out of the ground. I mean, they were in the midst of the garden. The other trees were uh, good for food. But it never says the tree of life and tree of knowledge are good for food. Okay, so those are two different trees. Those are two different spiritual principles there. Uh, and we talked about before, the tree of life is still in the, in the paradise, in the midst of the paradise of God, from Genesis chapter, or Revelation chapter 2, verse 7. It's still in the midst of the paradise of God. So if, it, if, if that is a literal tree, we should be able to find it in a literal place on this literal earth. But we can't find it anywhere on this literal earth. And so we understand that this is a, f a figurative tree um, headed up and, and personified by the Lord Jesus Christ. And the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is personified by Satan. Okay, so there's those two things. But, but they're, they're, they're more than that. They're the principles of life and death. They're principles of obedience and disobedience. They're principles of reproducing life what we talked about before. So we have those two trees in the midst of the garden. They're not literal trees, they're figurative trees. That's point number 21. Point number 22, Genesis 3, 6. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eye, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat, and all, gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. So this tree 
uh, is pleasant and desired. These words speak of beauty. These words speak of lust. These words speak of pleasure. What kind of tree brings lust and pleasure? And what kind of tree makes you wise? See, it doesn't make any sense to say this is a literal, absolutely a literal tree. These, these were figurative trees which they ate of. They don't make, there's no tree that you can eat of that makes you wise. A a amen. So that, that point number 23 ties into point number 22. Why is it said, if you read like in Genesis chapter 4, and Adam knew his wife Eve, and Cain knew his wife, and Adam knew his wife again. Why does it say he knew her? You know, we can go to the other uh, uh, euphemisms that are used in Scripture. Uh, Abraham laid with his wife. Um, uh, Elkanah came in unto his wife. So these, these uh, euphemisms make sense when it's talking about the act between a husband and wife, but to say a man knew his wife, what, what did he know about her? It doesn't, there's no connection to that act. So how does it connect? Well, look at the very scripture, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So the tree of knowledge is connected to Adam knowing his wife, or Cain knowing his wife. It's the tree of knowledge, carnal, sexual knowledge. So that's connected together, Number to point number 23. Point number 24 24. Uh, this one is from Matthew 15 and verse 11. Not that which go goeth into the mouth defileth a man, but that which cometh out of the mouth that defileth a man. This is a scriptural principle not just for the New Testament, for the Old Testament, for, for all of history. Okay, so what comes into us does not defile us. Now, Adam and Eve, if they literally ate a literal fruit from the tree of knowledge, that which went into them did defile them. Okay, but that's not true. That's just, that's just a, an allegory, a euphemism, in order to speak of what the original sin was, which was an, an, an adultery and going after sex for the sake of the pleasure that it brings, instead of waiting for the time of life and going according to the perfect timing and perfect will of God. So that which goes into a man does not defile him, but that which comes out of his mouth defiles him. His behaviors, his attitude, his action defiles him. The actions of Adam and Eve defiled them, not eating a fruit. Amen. So that was point number 24. That's the last one. And now I want to go in a little bit before we close this out into history. So um, is this a new doctrine from 1950s or is it something that was believed by uh, Jewish people and Christians in the past. So let's look at some of this. This is just taken from a Wikipedia page, but you can find it in uh, any uh, old Jewish uh, writings like the, the Targums and the Talmud and so forth, and the different writings of different rabbis through history. So uh, I'm just going to read this. In Jewish tradition, these are, diff these are speaking of rabbis, Philo, Perk de Rabbi, Eliezer and the Targum of Jonathan asserted that Adam was not the father of Cain. Rather, Eve was subject to adultery, having been seduced by either Samael or the serpent in the Garden of Eden, or the devil himself. Christian exegesis of the evil one in 1 John 3, 10 through 12 have also led some commentators like Tertullian to agree that Cain was the son of the devil. So let's look what Tertullian wrote uh, in his book or his letter, Patience, f chapter 5, verse 15. He says, this was from the third century, Tertullian writing this. Um, and he was a, you know, what you'd call a mainstream Christian writer of the time. 
believed in the power of God and and the Holy Ghost moving amongst the people. He says, having been made pregnant by the devil, she brought forth a son. So here we have uh, an early Christian writer clearly stating the original sin was adultery. Now, here's another writing. This is from uh, a Targum. Targum is something that takes the Bible verses and it sort of expands them to give you a, a, a bigger understanding. It doesn't pretend to be the Bible itself, but it's sort of like a commentary on the Bible, but using the, the words of the Bible to elaborate. So, this is from the Targum of Jerusalem, and it says this, And Adam knew Eve, his wife, who had desired the angel, and she conceived and bare Cain, and she said, I have acquired a man, the angel of the Lord. And she added to bear from her husband Adam, his twin, even Abel. Okay, so there it's, it's, it's saying that it was an angel that, that did it. Now, we understand that it was the serpent. It wasn't an angel coming down and doing it. it was, the serpent was a, a beast of the field. It was an animal. But he was so close, like almost in the image of man, walking on two feet and could speak and could reason with them. So, uh, but through this, uh, through this serpent, it was uh, the devil work operating through him that brought forth, uh, produced Cain. And even they say there, she added with her husband from her husband his twin, even Abel. So even back then they understood that. Two different. There can be two husbands, or uh, two men, uh, uh, bringing forth children from one wife, uh, twins at the same time. So, uh, but we understand that it wasn't literally an angel. It was, it was a, uh, the serpent, which was so closely related to the human race and could do many things that the humans could do, but was not made in the image and likeness of God. So. Um, with that said, you know this is not a doctrine that we're uh, making up. This is not a doctrine of, of to say any sp specific race is uh, uh, better than another race. We're all from Noah and his wife. Uh, we're from from them and from Ham, Shem, and Japheth and their wives. So all of our DNA is coming from them, and so all of that is producing all of us who are black, brown. Uh, red, white, pink, <laughs> etc., whatever colors we might be referred to as. But um, uh, any, any, anyways, this is not a new doctrine. This is something from history. This is something that's scriptural and absolutely clear uh, through the scriptures as we brought forth 24 different points from the Bible. So this is well, well pro proven. Uh, from Genesis to Revelation. So may God bless you. Let's close with a word of prayer. Father, we come to you. We ask that the Holy Spirit would just be with us, guiding us in every circumstance. Those who are listening now, if they have a need, Father, may the Holy Spirit come and meet that need, Lord, whether it be healing, whether it be a, uh, a financial provision, uh, whether it be an answer. Uh, to a difficulty in their life, Lord, would you move in a supernatural way even now to meet that need at this very moment that they're listening to my voice. Commit each one to your hands in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.